Well, welcome, everybody. Man, I'm so thankful that you're worshiping with us today as a Pine Lake family. Can I just take a moment to say, hey, thank you to our worship team. They are working tirelessly, man. They're doing such an incredible job of leading us all over the place, wherever we are, to, to worship Jesus, to raise our hallelujah, to declare that, that we're not alone. There's another in the fire with us. And I know this may be a little bit weird, but hey, look, let's get over it, right? There's a lot that's weird about these days. Hey, but would you just help me in thanking them? I'm just going to clap right now. Would you just clap right now in your living room just for a second to say thank you. They're sharing their talents, their gifts with us, and it's helping us to stay focused and centered on Jesus. The nearness of the Lord is our good. I read that in the Psalms this week, and, and man, just worship is helping us do that. Hey, I want to talk with you today about foundations. This has been on my heart for some weeks now, and just as I've been living and thinking and praying, God's been speaking to me a lot about foundations. If you've ever built a house, you know that your foundation truly matters. It's important to have a solid foundation. You don't really think about your foundation. You don't really think about how important that is. Once your house is built, none, nobody ever drops by and goes, oh my gosh, your foundation is amazing. I mean, who designed it? Nobody will ever do that. But your foundation is the single most important thing about your house. Your, your foundation determines the size and the strength of your house. Your foundation literally holds your house together, and it's what enables your house to endure the storms and the seasons of life. That's the purpose of your foundation. Now, in Mississippi, we have this thing called Yazoo clay. Some of y'all have heard of Yazoo clay. Yazoo clay is called bad dirt. Right? It's bad dirt because Yazoo clay is actually an expansive clay. It either expands or, or contracts depending on weather and rain and seasons and stuff like that. Now, if your house is built on bad dirt, Yazoo clay, a bad foundation, as that foundation expands or contracts, all of a sudden your house begins to be stretched and broken apart. Literally, your house begins to move as the, the ground, the foundation beneath it moves. Some years ago, uh, when, when Pine Lake built its first building, it was actually built on Yazoo clay. And so every time there was a change in the weather, more rain, less rain, the, literally the church building would move. And as we were contemplating some years ago, moving just a few miles down the road, some suggested that we just be patient and wait because eventually the Yazoo clay was going to probably move the church down the road anyway, right? It's just bad dirt. It's a bad foundation. Now, some of y'all don't get that, but that's a real thing where a lot of us live. Now, here's what I want to talk with you about today. The deal is when you're building your life, just like if you're building a house or another structure, it's important that you have a solid and a sure foundation. Your whole life is going to rise or fall. It's going to be held together and endure based on the foundation upon which you build. Now, that's what Jesus is going to teach us today in the book of Matthew chapter 7. I want to ask you to get a Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 7. Look, I'm doing church like you're doing church. I know a lot of people ain't, don't have their Bible, but I'm asking you, would you get a Bible? Make it your practice to open the Word. Just don't rely on what's going to be on the screen. It's all going to be on the screen. But I'm telling you, God will speak to you as you begin to make notes in the Word. So would you take a Bible, go get one if you need to, send the kids to get it, whatever, but get a Bible in front of you, Matthew chapter 7. Now, I want to kind of give you the context for that while y'all are looking for your Bible, since you didn't bring it. Okay, here's the context. Here's the context of Matthew 7, where we're going to be. It's the end of Jesus' most famous sermon. He preaches this sermon called the Sermon on the Mount. Maybe you've heard of it. This was, Jesus had lots and lots of people, a crowd coming to him all the time. And so he issues to them this radical, just crazy call for them to come out of religion as they knew it and to come out of the culture in which they lived and to live a totally different kind of of life, a life where they had a different set of values and where their heart and their mindset set weren't on self or the things of this world, but were totally founded in, built on a faith in God. Jesus started the message. Maybe you remember part of it where he said, hey, blessed are the poor in spirit. He says, hey, look, don't live a prideful, self-centered, independent life. No, you need to acknowledge you need me. Blessed are those who mourn. The goal of your life is not to just be happy at all costs. No, the more you get to know me, Jesus says, the more what you see in this world will actually break your heart. 
He says, blessed are the gentle. That, that, that in this world where everybody's living on a power trip and grasping for more, he says, I want you to be marked by humility. Instead of living to have every one of your personal desires gratified, he said, blessed are you when you hunger and thirst for righteousness. Instead of strength and self-assertiveness, I want you to be blessed by being merciful. In the world where lying and deception are just accepted practice, hey man, that's just the way you do business in the world today. Jesus said, no, not in my kingdom. In my kingdom, you're blessed whenever you're pure of heart. In a day and time where everybody seemed to be filled with hatred toward people who didn't agree with them, Jesus said, you're blessed if you're a peacemaker. And where most everybody in Jesus' day had a fear of commitment. Anybody got that? Come on, look at your neighbor and say, yep, I know you got it. I've had it before, right? A fear of commitment. A fear to you know, really commit to anything. I want to keep my options open. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Whether it's somebody who's asking you on a date or, or you're more serious in the relationship or asking about plans for the weekend, you try to keep your options open. But Jesus said, listen, you're blessed whenever you're so locked down and, and locked in with spiritual life that even if persecution arose, you would say, I'm not moving. I'm not moving. I'm standing for what I believe in. Only in living this way, Jesus taught, would you actually be a light in the darkness? Would you positively and powerfully influence the people around you? In this sermon, Jesus raises the bar on every aspect of their religious life. He said, I didn't come to abolish the law. I didn't come to tear it down or do away with it. I came to actually to fulfill it, to, to call you to a higher standard. Y'all have heard it, right? You've heard it. Don't murder. But Jesus said, I, I say, don't even get angry. Come on, y'all have heard, don't commit adultery, man, that'd be bad. That's a sin right there. But Jesus said, I'm saying to you, don't even entertain lustful thoughts in your mind. I mean, you've heard, hey, don't swear and make promises. Come on, how many of y'all done that? I swear on my mama's grave, man. No, Jesus said, quit. Quit having to add to your word. Just let your yes be yes or your no be no. You've heard, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But I'm saying to you, turn the other cheek. Go an extra mile. You've heard, love your neighbor, and yet Jesus says, but I'm saying to you, love your enemy. Bless them, pray for them, help them, all right? Jesus is calling you, me, the disciples, to a radical life. He's saying, look, I want you to give, pray, and fast, but I don't want anybody to know when you're doing it. You're doing it for God, not for people. Jesus said, when it comes to money, you got to know you can't serve God and money. You got to pick one way or the other. He says, when it comes to worrying in my kingdom, Jesus said, that's out. Don't worry about anything. Seek first my kingdom and everything you need is going to be added. Trust me. I'll give to you what you need. But don't worry. Trust. Don't grab. Trust. And while worrying may be out, hey, look, praying is definitely in. Ask, seek, knock, keep on doing it. Believing that your Father in heaven is a good Father. He knows exactly what you need. and He's going to give it to you exactly when you need it. And don't judge people. Hey, man, why are you worried about somebody's speck whenever you got a big old plank in your own eye? Remember that when Jesus taught that? Why are you worried about some little something in somebody else's eye when you got your own junk to be worried about? Jesus was down with us. He said, listen, quit judging people. Instead, here's what I'd like for you to do, the golden rule. Why don't you do to other people the very thing you would want them to do for you? The way you want to be treated, treat other people. That's what Jesus was saying. Now, he knows. Now, he knows he's got a lot of people who are listening to him, just like right now. There are a lot of people maybe worshiping with us right now uh, online. Right now, there may be two or three or four people listening with you in the same room. And what Jesus knows is that everybody's response is not the same. Jesus says, there are a lot of people here, but listen, if you're going to follow me, it's a real small gate and a real narrow way. It's going to cost you. You don't get to just do whatever the heck you want to do. No, this is a narrow way, a small way. Very few people are going to go this way. And he also knew that some would promise to, even intend to walk his way, do his thing, live this sermon. But when the pressure came, when temptation arose, when the storms rise, not so much. Their mouth would say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. But their daily decisions would say, I don't think so. That, that he called them, he said, he said, you're like a tree. It doesn't matter what kind of tree you call yourself. Here's how you know what kind of tree you really are. Look at your fruit. And so Jesus is totally aware of people who, are, who, are who know. Look, I, I know I want to, but Jesus is saying, but yes, but will you take the next step to actually do something? 
He's calling them. He's calling you right now. He's calling you to be different from the world for your foundation. He's calling you to move past good intention and information. And he's asking you today to lay a foundation for your life that is built on an active faith obedience to God. Not just words, but deeds. So then he comes to the end of his sermon. And this is the way he ends his sermon. So so we're just going to look at his last closing story, his closing parable. Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 24, this this is what Jesus said, right? He says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine but does not act on them. Hey, he's going to be like a foolish person who built his house on the sand. And the same storm, the same rain fell, the same floods come, the same winds blow and slam against that house, and it fell in great was its fall. Hey, just for a couple of minutes, can we talk about this message that Jesus was laying before his disciples and and you and me today about foundations? There's a reality, a revelation, and then ultimately a response that Jesus is calling for. Here's the reality, and if you're a note taker, this is what I would want you to write down. Here's the reality. Storms are a part of life, so just get used to it. Storms are a part of life for everybody So just get used to it. Don't act like what you're going through right now is some weird thing, like this has never happened before, it's never going to happen again. No, Jesus is trying to prepare you for the real world with a real foundation, and he's telling the story, this parable, that the storm's coming, and the storm is coming to everybody. Everybody's building a house, right? This is what he's saying. Everybody's building a house, and the house is a metaphor for your life. Everybody's building it, and you want your house to look good. You want it to have curb appeal, right? You want people to look at your house, your life, and go, oh my gosh, you sure have it going on, right? But here's the reality that Jesus is saying. Storms are going to come to every house, to every life. Same storm many times, sometimes different storms, but you can count on the fact that storms are going to come. The Bible says, Jesus said earlier in the sermon, listen, my Father causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Storms are a part of life. They'll be relentless and sometimes very, very powerful. Now, when I was in, I can't remember if it was high school or college, Um, I learned about a thing called the Yohari window. Anybody, come on, college students out there, somebody talk to me about Yohari window. You know what I'm talking about? Where you lay out these different kind of options and you try to figure out, you know, kind of where you are. And so I've kind of drawn a Yohari window about storms. There are types of storms and there's the scope of the storm. Some storms are immediate and some are ultimate. Some are personal and some are pan, right? That means everybody's included. Right now, there's an immediate personal storm that maybe you're walking through. Nobody else may be going through it, but it could be something like a breakup. It could be go th- something like you got a bad diagnosis, right? Not, not COVID. Okay, you got, you got a different kind of bad diagnosis, that, that you're going through something personal right now. There's tension in your family, or that you're trying to figure out what you're going to do after graduation. You're trying to figure out what you're going to do about your wedding now, that, that it doesn't look like anybody's going to be able to come. That's a personal storm. But then there, and, and it's immediate, but there's also a, 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 an, an everybody, an all skate, right? A pandemic. That's what we have right now. There is a pandemic where everybody right now is being affected. But there are also ultimate storms. And in this context, I think the ultimate storm, and this is really what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about immediate storms, but ultimately he's talking about the storm of death. And that death, that storm's going to come for you personally one day. And are you ready? Are you really ready? Do you have a foundation that will weather that storm? But in the context of him introducing his kingdom, he's saying that there's an ultimate storm that's going to come for everybody, the return of Christ one day when he comes to fully enter in, usher in his kingdom. it's, It's a storm of death and judgment that will encompass the whole world. And he's trying to get his disciples and help you today to be ready for that storm, to build on a foundation that can weather no matter what happens in in the big scheme of things. So here's what I'm trying to say to you. Don't freak out right now because you're in the middle of a storm. Storms are a part of life. 
I want the youngest person in the room right now to look at the oldest person in the room and ask them a question. Are storms a part of life? And I want the oldest person in the room to tell the truth. Don't lie. Hey, you're not doing your kids a favor if you lie to them and go, oh, no, life's never hard. No, life is hard. And the sooner they get that, the better off they're going to be and realize they got to have a good foundation. So don't freak out. Don't freak out that you're going through a storm. It's part of life. But here's the second thing I want to say to you. You better get prepared. You need to be prepared. You can prepare Whether it's an immediate storm or the ultimate storm, whether it's for you personally or for all of us together, you can be prepared for this storm. That's the reality. Here's the second thing. There's a revelation that takes place. That's what Jesus is trying to speak to. This is what he's teaching. There's a revelation. Storms don't determine your foundation, but they do reveal it. In other words, in the storm is not the time to try to build your foundation. No, the storm's not going to build your foundation. The storm's going to reveal your foundation foundation, whether it's a good foundation or a bad foundation. There is such thing as a good foundation, right? Matthew 7, 24, Jesus said, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock so that there are some houses that have a really good foundation. That's what Jesus is trying to say. In the Old Testament, this idea of of a good foundation built on the rock, in the Old Testament, that rock is God. He is the God of our salvation, the rock of our salvation, it says. Peter in the New Testament says that, listen, Jesus is the cornerstone. He's the one that we build our lives on. Paul in 1 Corinthians 3 says there can be no other foundation other than the one laid. That's Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 10, 4, Paul says they all drank, talking about even the Old Testament, all drank from the same spiritual drink, for they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. Now, there's a whole lot we could talk about about that. But the picture that God was trying to say to his children is, listen, I am the foundation that you will always build your life on. And that's what Jesus is saying. Hey, build your life on the rock. Now, here's the distinction that Jesus is making in the Sermon on the Mount. He's not saying build your life on the rock, i.e., just believe in me. Just believe that God is the rock. Believe that Jesus is the rock, my foundation. No, look at how he defines it. Verse 24, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts. Do you see it? I hear it. Oh, I believe it. But until you act on it, until you act on it, you're not building on the foundation. When you act on them, that's when you're compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. The Bible tells us, Jesus, just a couple of verses before that, Matthew 7, 21, not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, even using the right words, the right name, not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who, do you see it, who does the will of my Father in heaven. That's the one that's going to enter. James, the half-brother of Jesus, wrote this in James 1, you prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves, fool themselves. You're kidding yourself. This is, what the God, this is what God's trying to say to us. That if all our foundation is, is knowledge and good intention, but there's no action and no obedience and follow through, you're not building on the right foundation. Jesus is calling us to have a follow through. Let me ask, let me put it this way. Okay, here's the deal. Would you rather have somebody say to you, oh my gosh, I love you? Say to you, oh my gosh, I'm gonna be there. I'm gonna help you out, bro. I got you. Would you, would you rather have somebody say, oh, I'm gonna be faithful? Or it's, it's you and me. Would you rather have somebody say that and then not do it? Or would you rather have somebody say, hey, I love you, and then I demonstrate it every day? Say, hey, man, I'm gonna help you, and then I show up in your time of need. Oh, I'm going to be faithful to you. And then they are faithful, even in the fire. You get it? You feel it? Okay, if that's what you want, not just whack, 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 but do something, that's what Jesus is saying. It's anybody can talk a good game, but he's calling you to live your life on a good foundation of obedience. If the foundation is action, not intention, then can I ask you a question? How strong is your foundation for life? If the foundation for your life is your action, you're actually following through in obedience to God, not your intention for God, how strong is your foundation? Can I ask you kids? I right, talk to a lot of children, right? A lot of kids, a lot of grade school kids. 
If the, if the foundation for your life is obeying Jesus, honoring your mom and dad, not bullying your little brother or sister, if that's the foundation, obedience to that, not just doing it, how strong is your foundation, kids? Can I talk to some high school and college kids? Oh, gosh, you love passion. Oh, my gosh. Going to passion, going to passion camp. It's amazing, baby. It's fire, fire, fire. Love it. Oh, you come on with some strong intentions. But do you then walk in purity? Do you then stay faithful to God even if it means you're going to spend your weekend alone? Can I talk to some grown folks, man? All the grown people watching right now, wherever you are. Listen, it's easy for us to say, oh, yes, I believe in God. Oh, yes, God's trustworthy. He's able. Oh, he's faithful. But do you really trust him with your money? Oh, man, God's word. Oh, that's fact right there. God's word is truth. It's solid. It's unshakable. But are you doing the very things that his word tells you then to do? Like tell truth. Be kind. Oh, his grace, man, his grace is sufficient. It's more than enough. But if it's really more than enough and you know that, are you both standing in that and then giving that same kind of love to your spouse right now who may be on your last nerve because y'all been cooped up so long? Are you giving grace to people in this world who don't tweet what you like or don't like your post or who may disagree with you? See, a good foundation is marked not by intention but by action, a life of surrender and humble obedience. But if you can have a good foundation, you can also have a bad foundation. That's what the storm's revealing, Matthew 7, 26. Again, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. There's a bad foundation built on the sand. Man, thank God the beaches are are about to be back open if they're not already where you live. They're about to be back open. People are going to be going back to the beach at some point, we hope. And part of that pilgrimage is to go to the sand sand and and build a sandcastle. Come on, kids. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Make your daddy go to Dollar General and get the little package with the bucket and the shovel and a little thing where you can put the little stuff on the top of the castle. We all do it. And, And you may labor to build a sandcastle. Some people build huge sandcastles. I mean, that's like money right there. That thing is crazy. But what do you know about a sandcastle? Look, you come back tomorrow morning and it's gone. Why? Because either the tide comes in and washes it all away or some tractor comes down the beach with this thing that chews up everything and just obliterates it. But it is not gonna be there tomorrow, right? It's built on the sand. Now, in that same way, this is what Jesus is saying. Some of us are building our lives on sand because you're hearing God. You're knowing maybe even spiritual truth, but it's not the anchor and God for your life. Instead, you're building your your life on things that promise security, but in the end, they cannot deliver. You're building on a bad foundation. I've been thinking about bad foundations and some of the revelation of bad foundations over the last few weeks and Man, I found out, you know what? Money's not a very good foundation, is it? I mean, come on, February the 12th, the stock market hit an all-time high, 29,000 points plus. But you know what? 40 days later, isn't it weird how God does stuff? 40 days later, what we would call a quarantine. 40 days later, on March the 23rd, it dropped to 18,000-something, and trillions of dollars of wealth had vanished. Come on, whenever your, whenever your statement comes in for the first quarter, don't even look. <laughs> just, just file it away. It's gone. You know what else is a bad foundation? Sports have turned out to be a bad foundation. Man, I think about all the time, all the energy, all the passion, all the money, all the hope, all the argument I arguing I've done about if Michael Jackson uh, or Michael Jordan is the best basketball player of all time. And yes, he is. But you know what? Like that, sports are gone. Think about how much of your money, your time you've spent wagging your kids all around the southeast to play tournament ball, and it's gone. It's over. This is a precursor of their life. Sports are a bad foundation. Teach a lot of great lessons. It's a bad foundation. Work. You're giving 40 to 70 hours a week of your life to the man, only now to learn that you're non-essential. It's not a good foundation. Your health, thousands of people dying, and all of a sudden I'm aware of my mortality, of my frailty, and I'm scared. My health, I, I'm, not, I'm not invincible. You can't even go to the gym. You can't go get your swole on. You got furniture disease. Your chest is sinking down to your drawers, and there's nothing that you can do about it. Your six-pack's turning into a keg, right? 
I saw one person said, you know, at the end of this thing, I'm either going to be a hunk, a chunk, or a drunk. I don't know which one. But, but maybe you feel that way. Man, the thing that has been your identity, it's over. And come on, girls, y'all aren't exempt. You can't go get your hair did, your nails done. Y'all not posting all them selfies anymore, are you? No, not without a hat on. Right? What's happening? Man, that thing that we were basing our worth and value, in, that's over with. That was a lie. That was sand. Think about religion. I think God's exposing a bad foundation of religion because you can't come to church anymore. And if we couldn't do church online, would you have any spiritual life? Religion is a bad foundation. Friends, we spend our whole life trying to be accepted, trying to fit in, trying to get into the right sorority or fraternity. And now, bro, they sent you home. Ain't no chapter meetings. Ain't no getting together and having a party. That's done. Busyness and hurry. It's a bad foundation. We live in a go, go, go world, but here's the deal. Here's what we're finding. That go, 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 busy hurry was only keeping you from what really mattered, and it was preventing you from slowing down long enough to have to deal with the person who's staring back at you now in the mirror, and you're like, who am I? I'm busy and hurry and meetings. It's a bad foundation. I have a new friend that was introduced to me. His name's Luke McDonald. One of his posts read like this. It just said, you're worried about being exposed to corona? But perhaps you should be more worried about how corona is exposing you. This moment puts intense pressure on every area of your life, and in a few weeks it's revealing any small fissure or comprom- of compromise or dissonance you've been overlooking. The way you communicate with your spouse in your marriage, how much of your parenting is simply distracting your kids, your true financial situation, how necessary you really are at your job, the strength of your relationships, etc. The exposure brings sorrow when you realize things aren't as good as you thought, but it also brings an opportunity to grow and to change and work on what isn't unnecessary. Hey, he said, don't just avoid getting the virus, avoid ignoring what it's revealing. You see, here's what I believe. I believe that God will, in his grace, mercy, and love, allow storms to come to your life, personally or to all of us. Maybe it's even his mercy and love that sometimes will send a storm to your life. Why? To reveal to you that what you're building on is not a good foundation so that you can make adjustments and be able to stand. That's what Jesus was trying to say. Build on a good foundation, and let the storms reveal whether you're on track or not. C.S. Lewis is a guy that I've, I've read a couple of books of his, and it's hard. I mean, he's like so dang smart. Uh, it's just hard for me to get, get down with it. I read his book called The Great Divorce recently, and it took me like four or five chapters just to get into it, but, but eventually it was just an amazing book. God gifted this man incredibly. In 1942, C.S. Lewis wrote this. 1942. Come on, stay with me. In 1942, this is what he wrote. Satan says, I'm going to cause anxiety, fear, and panic. I'm going to shut down your businesses, your schools, your places of worship, and your sporting events, and I'm going to cause economic turmoil. And Jesus says, and I'm going to bring together neighbors and restore the family unit. And I'm going to bring dinner back to the kitchen table. I will help people slow down their lives and appreciate what really matters. I'm going to teach my children to rely on me and not on the world. I'm going to teach my children to trust me and not their money and their material resources. Can you believe that? He wrote that in 1942. You know what it tells me? It tells me that our generation isn't really all that. That for a long time, The enemy's been trying to get you to build on a shaky foundation of things that ultimately are not going to matter. And yet Jesus is saying, but I'm here. And I'm with you in the fire. And I'm going to help you to build a good foundation when you walk with me. You see, here's the deal. There are good foundations and bad foundations. And whenever your foundation is good, no matter how hard the storm is, personal or pandemic, you're going to stand. But if your foundation is bad when the storm comes, here, no matter how much you fight, claw, scratch, and try, you're going to fall. Your house is going to fall apart. That's what Jesus said. Not Chip, please hear me. That's not my word. That's what Jesus ended his sermon with. It's either going to stand or fall based on your foundation. 
And that leads us to the conclusion of our, our worship today in, in this sermon, and that is your response. Now, what you do next matters. Come on, what you're about to do with the, with the rest of your days, it really matters. If these storms are revealing that, man, you've got a good foundation, and, man, you're standing in this storm, can I just say to you, bro, you just keep on doing you. Come on, man, you just keep on going. You, you keep enjoying the peace that that brings and, and let praise rise, and you keep making progress, that, that your foundation's strong, and that ought to give you peace. You can rest knowing that God's protecting you, he's seeing you through, and it's rough, it's a storm, but man, God is showing up. You have peace and rest. I read recently Psalm 33, verses 18 and following, it says, Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him. And those who hope for his loving kindness, listen, he's there to deliver their soul from death and keep them alive even in the famine or the pandemic. Our soul waits for the Lord, and he is our help and our shield. You see, whenever you fear and you hope and you wait on and trust in God, God says, I will see you through. I'll be a sure foundation for you. You know, there, in addition to the, the crazy storms that, that are affecting everybody in the world, there was a very personal, uh, immediate storm that, that hit the southern part of Mississippi recently where hundreds of people were impacted, many lost their lives. And there was this story that came out of South Mississippi where this family, um, with just a few seconds to spare, tornado is approaching, they ran into a storm shelter in their house. And I don't know all about their house, but, but there's a picture of the devastation, the aftershot. They're, they're, everything's decimated, but that storm shelter, that safe room, they got into it with just a few seconds to spare. And the owner of the house, the man said, you know what? We got in here by the grace of God, and that's all that's left. Now, would you look at that picture just for a second? Everything of the world was destroyed, but what mattered most survived because it was in a safe room with a good foundation. Can I just say to you, let that picture be your peace. When you're in Christ, you can have peace. You're going to weather every storm. Would you let, it, would you let that reality lead you to praise? Come on, church, we got to get our praise on. Raise our hallelujah. Psalm 33, verse 21 says, Our heart rejoices in Him because we trust in His holy name. Our heart rejoices even in the storm. It's difficult, it's hard, but we can still have joy. His joy becomes our strength. And what I'm hearing people tell me as I'm interacting is, you know what, this is either the best of times or the worst of times. And for those who have a bad foundation, this is the worst time ever. But for a lot of people who are even out of work, I heard one of our elders say, look, I'm a commissioned salesman. I'm not able to work. But God's so good to me and to my family. And there's joy even in the midst of the chaos. And you keep making progress. You keep growing. You let these storms right now refine and strengthen your faith. God is growing you. James says in James 1, 2, he says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter these various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith is producing endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, that you would be perfect and complete. You're lacking in nothing. God's using this to strengthen you and prepare you for the ultimate storm. And Peter wrote about that ultimate storm in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6. He said, in this you greatly rejoice. Right now, they were going through it, persecution. In this now you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials. It was not easy to walk this Jesus way. The source of the trial was being persecuted for their faith. But he says, you rejoice so that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold which is perishable even though tested by fire may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ in other words when the ultimate storm comes you're going to be able to raise your hands and praise God and say my foundation held my foundation was sure because I not only trusted Jesus but I lived in Jesus those storms are revealing that your foundation is strong, man, you keep living. But if you're sitting here right now and you're recognizing, you know what, I think something's jacked up in my life. And Chip, when you were talking just a minute ago about all the things that you could build your life on that are not good foundations, dude, I was up in there like multiple times. And if you're sitting here right now, listen, and you're thinking, man, I think the foundation of my life is messed up. I'm on the sand right now. You can do one of two things. You can either say, hate it, but I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing, baby. 
Can I just say to you, that would be foolish. That's what James would say. You're kidding yourself. You're deluding yourself. If you think just because you believe in God, that's all you got to do. James says in James 2.19, the demons believe in God. You can just do nothing. You can keep on going, and you know what? You're going you're gonna to fall in the next storm, and in the next storm, and in the ultimate storm. But you, you, can, you can take the loving act of God right now toward you to make some adjustments, to recognize, you know what? I think I've been building on, on the sand, and, and man, I really want to change, and I want my life to be built upon the rock. And I think that's exactly what Jesus was saying to the disciples in his day and saying to you and me right now. That some of you right now, listen, maybe for the first time, you're hearing Jesus say to you, I love you, and I'm offering you grace and mercy and forgiveness, but this is an all-in with me. I'm asking you to humbly admit that you don't have this figured out, and you can't take it on your own. And if you'll ask me to forgive you, if you'll ask me in humility and grace to make you alive and become the very center of your life where you don't worry, you trust, where you pray, you seek, and you ask, and you knock, and you walk with me, he says, I'll be a sure foundation for you that can stand any storm. And that next storm that comes to you, you're going to stand. And when that ultimate storm comes, you're going to have peace. You're going to be able to praise. And you're going to stand with your hands raised and say, God, I thank you. You know, in thinking about this message, I, I did a little bit of Google searching about storms and foundations, and I came across an incredible story from 2008, a story from Gilchrist, Texas, this incredible picture of a, of a house that's standing after Hurricane Ike. I don't know if y'all remember that, that storm hitting the Texas uh, panhandle down there uh, uh, where, where Gilchrist, Texas is, but, but this little peninsula right here, everything is decimated except for this one house that's sitting there standing. 200 houses blown away, but this house that, that belonged to Warren and Pam Adams, it's standing there. Now, here's what's amazing about this picture. Warren and Pam Adams three years before that, 2005, lived on that exact same lot in a totally different house when Hurricane Rita came. And Hurricane Rita decimated their house, leveled it, blew it away, lost everything. And yet because they wanted to live there, they felt like that was home, they made a decision to build with a better foundation. Mr. Adams employed an engineering company to oversee the construction of his new house. They dug deep. They built high. And three years later, when the rains fell, and the waters rose, and the winds slammed against that house, it stood because its foundation was strong. Can I just say to you, that's a picture of hope for you right now. That though you may have felt like everything about your life has been undone and decimated, Jesus specializes in resurrecting things and giving you a brand new chance to build again, to start over, and to have a life that stands. We're about to close our time today, and I'm going to lead us to pray. And at the end of that prayer, there are going to be some folks who are online with you. They'd love to chat with you. If you wanted to pray with you, for you, over you, please let us know. But I want to lead us to pray two things. Would you pray with me right now, just right now where you are? Would you just close your eyes if that would help you? Maybe it would help you to open your hands. I do that often. We pray this way as if to say to God, God, we need you. We need your help. We need your grace, and God, we're offering to you some things. Could I lead you to pray this way? Would you, if, you're, if your foundation has been firm, and this has been a tough season, but your foundation has stood, would you just thank God right now? Would you raise your hallelujah with everything inside of you? Would you praise him that even in the midst of the fire, you've not been alone? He's giving you grace. He's giving you strength. And he's protecting you, shielding you. Come on, would you just give God thanks? Would you let his peace that passes understanding guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus? You may not know where your next job's going to come from, where your income's going to come from. You, you may not know. 
a lot of things, but would you just say, Jesus, I trust you, I praise you, and I thank you that even in the midst of this, God, you've been good to me. You've been good to my friends. You've been good to my family. I thank you. Could I lead some of you to pray a prayer of adjustment? Maybe for the first time in your life, would you just pray this prayer with me? And Would you say, God, I've been building on the wrong stuff. And I've been building my house on the sand. And God, it's not standing. And everything's falling apart. And I really need you. I confess that I've been selfish. I've been prideful. I've been self-centered. I've been disobedient to you. And I need you to forgive me. Jesus, I need you to change me. I'm trusting, Jesus, that this kingdom call on my life, that, that you made possible by dying on the cross for me and then conquering death to give me a new life, not religion, not culture, but to call the call to walk with you. Jesus, I want that. I accept that. And I'm asking you, by your grace, by your spirit, would you help me now to live my life honoring you? both in this storm. And God, I trust you in the ultimate storm. Your kingdom come. Your will be done now in my life. From now on, just like it is in heaven. God, that's our prayer today, is that you would hear us just worship you and thank you. God, I thank you in a weird way, even for the storms that are revealing, God, that our foundation is either sure or it's bad. And God, whenever we see that our foundation is sure, we praise you and we ask you just to continue to give us peace. God, hear our praise and God, continue to grow us. Give us progress in our faith as we look forward to the day that you come. And God, as you've revealed today, that God, there's a better way for some of us. Lord, I pray that this prayer we've prayed today of repentance and, and turning to you in faith, God, that new things would come. Beauty out of ashes. God, glory out of shame. That God, life would come from death. We bless you. We praise you. In the name of Christ.